talk to you about bonding, mostly plastics, but many different materials. It's a part of a, a multi-series uh, shoot we're going to be doing on bonding PLA, bonding flexibles, bonding multiple materials. But today is just the general introduction into the different types of adhesives uh, available and how to work with them. And uh, I'll sh share with you some of my secrets and tricks that I've learned over the years. Um, on this table we have a few categories of glues and I'll try to explain them to you briefly. And then we'll take a little pause and I'll show you uh, the best gluing types of joints and then we'll actually see these in action and how you use these. So starting off on the left side are the basically the super glues, the cyanacrylate or CA, a lot of us call them. There are many brands, Loctite, Henkel, the um, original super glues. There's plenty of others that are out there. There are formulas that are thicker and thinner, um, but they basically all work about the same. They catalyze by the presence of moisture. Um, so that's why they glue really well your fingers together when you get them on there. They're usually pretty thin. They can be a little bit thicker like gel, but they don't fill cleavage. They're not good gap fillers without some additives, which we can explain later. There are <coughs> accelerators available for the super glues. These help them to set up a lot faster and uh, make your work a lot more efficient. I'll show you how to use those. And then there's even simple remedies for accelerators and for cleavage fill, such as baking soda, bicarbonate. Very simple, very efficient. I'll show you how to use that. The next category of glues are epoxies. These are uh, Part A, point, part B mixture that you mix together, it creates a chemical reaction and catalyzes and hardens by mixing the two parts together. Uh, they usually, you, you might want to look around for the ones that have a five minute working time. These allow you to get something mixed and apply it in five minutes. Some of them can be much longer as far as long as even a 10 hour working time, but then you have this slop that sits around unhardened for hours. Almost all of them do require a full 24 hours afterwards to reach their full potential. Um, and they come in different forms. There, there are the syringes, there are the big bottles that I prefer to use because I do use quantities. The next groups are the solvents. There are many types of solvents. There are the organic solvents, which we'll be talking about, especially when we start getting into gluing flexibles later down the line. There are all the chemicals like the MEK, acetone, um, a lot of the solvents you'll buy specifically for the type of plastic you're using. Uh, this company, SideGrip, makes all different numbered ones depending on the plastic you're using. These are great for the styrenic based ABS, styrene and such. I usually get a little applicator bottle. I'll show you how I use this. Solvents are different than glues because they basically melt the plastics and by melting them they melt them together and they join them into one. It's basically like, like welding metal. You're actually using a solvent to melt the plastics together and you get a better joint and cleaner. It's very, they're very nice to use, but you have to find the right one for the right plastics. Um, we go through all the different solvents. We'll talk about those later. And then we can move over into the rubber cements. These are usually what you have in spray glues, industrial spray glues, in the mastic that they use in, in construction, or even simple cements. The interesting thing about these, these are considered contact cements. You put a little bit on each side of your piece, one on one piece, one on the other. You let it dry, and then the moment you put them together, you've got a permanent and great bond. So I'll talk about the advantages of each one of these and show them in action in a minute. Let's uh, have a real quick look on types of glue joints and what works best. So going from the worst to the best, the worst case is where you have one piece of a thin sheet and you try to join it to the edge of another thin sheet. You have very little surface and you have a lot of leverage to break that. That's a pretty bad joint. If you wanted to accomplish this better, you want to make sure that the glue actually can create a mechanical grip around it if, if you could do that. Of course, this is if the aesthetic would allow. The next best is to do a butt joint where the end touches a flat sheet. I'll show you a bunch of those today. 
there's still a very small surface area, but we can increase our mechanical hold by building up a little bit of material on one or two sides. If you had to have a clean side here, you'd leave that bare. If this was an internal part and you can build up some glue around it, we're starting to get a really mechan great mechanical grip. The strongest is actually to lay one sheet against another sheet and have a very large surface area in contact. And this is also great for all the thin solvents and the glues like uh, CA that use a capillary reaction. They get in there, you have a huge amount of surface area. They bond incredibly, I'll show you those. Once again, if you really had to have an incredible mechanical grip, you try to get the glue to go over the edges as well, but usually not necessary. Okay. By using these techniques, we can increase our strength greatly of the parts we're going to glue. Of course, it's going to be also dependent upon the visual, visual and aesthetic areas that you need on your part. So, let's get down to some examples of how to use the glues. I'm going to start with our super glues. Okay, so the super glues, let me start with a real quick little test on some styrene, some expanded styrene or Forex. I could simply just put a little bit of super glue onto this, try not to get too much, and then hold it down and let it dry. If I wanted to, I could hit it with some accelerator real quickly, and this will help it to catalyze and set up faster. Oh, sorry. The other thing we can do with super glue, like I said, it doesn't fill cleavage and it doesn't create any thickness. It's very, very, very thin. The other thing we can do with super glue is we can use a trick to actually build up some thickness. What I'll do here is the same thing I just did. I'll, I'll tack this thing down. Okay, and I'll run a bead of liquid here, uh, actual leave, actual liquid. I'll take some bicarbonate or some baking soda, and I'll just throw it on there. You could use your fingers to mush it in, but be careful, you've covered it well enough with the baking soda to not stick it to your hands. It catalyzes very, very quickly. As a matter of fact, it creates also a heat reaction because it's catalyzing so quickly. And I could, yep, something got on me and started burning slightly. Um, I could actually build up some volume there. I could repeat the process by going with another layer of liquid and then throwing on the baking soda. I could get this to be super strong by doing it to the other side as well and throwing on some baking soda. The nice thing is baking soda is not toxic. It's cheap. Get it in any supermarket for a dollar a box. It lasts forever. So we'll let that set for a second. We'll do a couple strength tests on these two. The one with baking soda, the one without. I do want to talk about the disadvantages of using CA. First of all, CA on PLA and many other materials creates a white haze. So for standard 3D printing, when you start gluing parts together, you really want to test it with your super glues because if you have a drop that goes out onto an aesthetic area, it's going to create a white haze that's really hard to get away. You can use some super glue solvents and slowly work them away, but I advise use super glue on the inner sides of the parts and not on the outer parts. Um, super glue is also great for wicking, meaning I could put two pieces of uh, material very tightly together, clamp them, and just put a little bit on the edge, and I could get it to wick in. Let me show you what that means right here. I'd clamp these two and I would just pour this on the edge and because of capillary reaction it's going to pull that material, that super glue, sorry let me just dry this off, it's going to pull that super glue onto the inside through wicking and capillary reaction. Because it's so thin, it allows it to get pulled in very well. I didn't do this end. We'll come back and test that bond as well in a little while. Okay. The last thing about super glue that I do want to warn people 
when you start using it with the baking soda, a lot of people have talked about on the forums using this as a spot putty or a gap filler, which I really highly do not recommend you to do this for. Um, the combination of super glue and, and uh, baking soda creates a very hard, very, very rigid, brittle mass. It's much harder than any of your plastics, especially your 3D printing filaments. So if you started to sand or file a part that you use this for gap filler, it would not be effective at sanding down the super glue baking soda area, but it would work your other part that you wanted to keep. So this is not a great uh, spot filler. I really recommend that you get some car shop uh, spot putty or bondo for thick big holes or light spot putty for little holes. Um, they're much lighter and easier to sand and they won't destroy your part. But you can use the super glue for the hidden internal areas. Okay, we'll let those dry and we'll come back to those. Moving along, I do want to show you epoxy. So, you can get the syringes that help to dose these parts out A and B easily, I like those. Um, or you can get the larger containers, which I tend to use. Some of them come with a little paddle, sometimes with a little mixing tray. I highly advise you not to use the, uh, the things that come with it, like this little depression here for the tray and swirling it around. This one has actually a place that you're supposed to mix it here. That swirling around with the stick method is terrible because it doesn't ensure that the part A and B mix well, and it doesn't ensure that you get a great catalyzed product. As a matter of fact, a lot of people wind up having an uncatalyzed area that never gets hardened, and they have a failed part that they have to throw away, and it remains sticky and messy. So I'm going to teach you how to mix it and how to apply it. Uh, super glue, let's go ahead and do this one on here. Super glue, you do want to prepare the piece because it's going to take five minutes to set up and a full day to get its strength. So I'll usually go ahead and just tape this to, sorry, tape this to the holder. This, is, this holder is covered with oil. Let me do this a little better. Okay. So I'm going to get this just rigged up into place. I should have done this with clamps, but so be it. Okay, this is ready. Ready to be glued. Now the one, the beauty of super glue is we can really get a nice mass going. Uh, what you do need is you need a cardboard sheet that you could possibly throw away. I like it when it's nice and smooth. I tend to use all of the the books that they send us in the mail that you can never seem to send back. Um, Uline and all the other promotional books. I use these as a mixing area and I could always peel them off and do another page. I use my freebie credit cards that are sent to me, room keys and passes as mixing pallets. This way you've got limitless supplies for mixing this stuff all for free. So what I do is I start by putting a glob of part A or part B down in one area and I just let it fall into its own diameter which will tend to go to a set diameter based on the thickness of the gel and the surface tension and then you put down the other part B making sure not to touch the two together as long as they're not touching you have plenty of time to adjust you can look after they've both settled and see if one is smaller than the other and possibly add a little bit more to the other one until you get them to be relatively the same size. I'm pretty happy with those right there. Yeah. You don't have to be a thousand percent perfect, but pretty close. Then you take a paddle and we want to try to knead this together so it all gets mixed thoroughly. So what I'll generally do is I'll pull it across horizontally relay it out horizontally, and then I'll collect it vertically. I'll lay it out horizontally. Now, when I lay it out the next time, I want to make sure that I get the stuff off the card because I don't want uncatalyzed material there. And then I'll start to collect it vertically. If you start to get this back and forth motion down, you can pr pretty much do this very quickly. 
I learned this from body shop mechanics a long time ago for Bondo mixing and it applies to epoxy mixing. If you do this right, you can get this stuff mixed in under 30 seconds. If you do it wrong, you could be mixing for minutes and minutes while it's catalyzing and you still don't get it mixed well. There we go, that's enough. I'm just going to collect it now into a nice pile. And this is a workable pile. I tend to clean my tools really quickly before applying the rest so I could use the tools over again. Just wipe them off there, a little bit of paper towel, and then I'm ready to go. I'll take some kind of an applicator. It's gooey stuff, it's dirty stuff, but it's very effective. You might want to get it on the underside a little bit. I'll lift this up slightly. And then I could build up a little bit of mass to try to create the mechanical bond. There we go. In about five minutes this will set up. I tend to leave this pile right here and go back and feel it before I ruin that bond. If you need to clean this up aesthetically, do it while it's nice and wet. Okay, so we'll put the epoxy aside and we'll come back to that a little bit later as well. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about are solvents. Like I said, these different solvents are for different materials. Um, this one is for acrylics and styrenic based. I have some really good acrylics here, so I'll be able to show you how those work. Um, let me grab a couple clamps real quickly. Okay. I like to get these little applicator bottles. You can get these in miniature funnels online. Usually these solvents are clear. Uh, don't be fooled by this color. It's just because I had pieces of material sitting in my old can, but it still works. Anyway, right now, just to show you how one of these solvents works, I have it in this applicator bottle. The best way to use a solvent, let me just get two clean surfaces, there we go. I'm going to clamp these together in the center so we can see the overlap. You want to clamp these as tight as possible and as thoroughly as possible. And then once again, we're going to use the capillary effect or the wicking effect to get this stuff to go in. I'm just going to use this applicator and you'll be careful not to stab yourself. I have injected myself with so many solvents over the years. It's amazing that I haven't become some weird monster. You can see how that stuff is going under there. It's not really getting to that little center part, but I could carefully go around and apply the solvents. You might want to, if you're very worried about the surface, keep some paper towels ready and dry off any excess or drips as you're going. This is also how they glue up plexiglass for aquariums. You can actually get a watertight, incredible bond with this method. Just move this to try to get that last bit in the middle. I'm not sure if I'm going to get it or if it's already sealed off. But there we go. Okay, so we'll let this one set. You do want to be careful to cap that hypodermic. You don't want to get yourself, like I said, with that. We'll let this set and we'll come back to it and we'll see how good of a bond this is. Um, that is an acrylic solvent. I do want to talk really quickly about the PVC solvents. Um, you know, I, I don't love using PVCs because they're very harmful, like ABS. PVCs are worse. The vinyl chloride is, is a dangerous chemical. But there are times that you need to use PVC, especially if you're using PVC tubes to build something from Home Depot or anywhere else. These solvents are so strong. The second you put them on, they grab. You really have to be careful to put them on right. They usually come with their own applicator brush. So generally, you just take your piece and you swipe it around just lightly. You don't need too much. That's a, quite a bit and then you put it in there. These two have a big gap between them, so I'll just, I'll, I'll let it lean on the bottom half. And that solvent already is gripping. It's already there. I'm gonna let it have a, it's time to really 
mesh, but we'll see what that does. Now remember, solvents are not glues. They evaporate when they're done. They don't leave any, any thick residue. It's just the melting of the plastic that creates the bond. Okay. And the very last glue I do want to show you is rubber cement. We could do that with two pieces right here. Okay. We can either simply just spray with a good industrial um, spray glue the two sides lightly and let them dry until they're uh, very lightly sticky to the touch and put them together. Or we can use a rubber cement like this one. I'll show you right now with the rubber cement. What we want to do is we want to coat both of them. This also comes with an applicator brush. You want to coat both of them quickly and thinly and evenly. So I usually put a little layer on with a brush um, on one and then spread it around so it's as thin as possible but covering the whole thing. You don't want to have any big wet spots because those tend not to ever dry. So I'll spread these around. There's a little bit on the side. There's one side. And then I'll do the same thing to the next pad, the next piece. Rubber cements are especially effective on flexible materials. If you were to put super glue or some of the other stiffer glues on a flexible piece and then flex it, you could just break the bond in many cases because they are not made to flex. Epoxies do not flex, super glues do not flex, many of the glues do not flex. So rubber cements are wonderful because they are a flexible glue. So if you have something like a rubber surface that has to be mounted to another rubber surface or a rubber surface that goes to a hard surface, you might want to use these. Um, they're used quite a bit in industry also um, to keep multi materials together. Okay. By the way, all of these glues are generally toxic have heavy fumes, um, you probably want to wear a respirator, work in a well-ventilated area, wear gloves, keep your hands clean. I always keep paper towels by my side and usually some alcohol to clean off my hands as I'm going, some gloves. So what we're waiting for here is for the rubber cement to glue until to the touch it feels like masking tape but it doesn't come off on your fingers. That's this drier area is already dry. This thicker area is too wet. I actually have some coming off on my finger. So I wait a little bit. Once that it's dry, we'll simply just put the two together and it will adhere through basic contact and very light pressure. I will let those dry. I'll put this together. We'll let everything have a couple of hours and then we'll come back and we'll do a little bit of stress testing to see where we got. Thank you. A few moments later. Okay, so we're back and about an hour has passed since we started our um, glue test. Some of them will be ready to test. Others would benefit from having 24 hours. But I think it's a good idea to sum up our findings and show you some applications. So let's start with the ones that we hit with the super glue or CA. This piece had just plain super glue and a little bit of activator. The nice thing is it was nice and clean. The negative is we have a butt joint with no extra mechanical bond here. So I'm going to try to break this. Yeah, it actually broke pretty well. The bottom didn't catalyze very well, I think, because the accelerator didn't get under there. It might have done a little bit better with a little more time or a little bit more wetness, but it did break. Oh, I even think there's some paper on the top. We might want to repeat this. This one had some paper on the top. That's why it had a bad seal. I'll repeat that right now because <laughs> it should have done a better job. Let me do it to this side. Okay, I'm going to put that on there. We'll come back to that in five minutes because I'll put the accelerator on. It should be fine. Okay. The next one was the uh, CA with the baking soda built up. You could see right there the thickness of the mechanical build. All 
I can't break it. It actually broke the plastic, not the weld. See that? That's a broken plastic, so pretty darn strong. Our next was using CA as a wicking element, clamping these two together, letting it go in. We have a huge surface area. I'm assuming it's set now. Yeah, that's never going to come apart. I mean, this is like your crazy glue ads in the 70s with the guy who would go to the beam. It's got a huge surface area, flat one to another. The amazing thing is we did not put any glue on the inside. We just clamped these together, went around the outside with the CA, and it went in. Amazing bond, as you can see. Let me see how this is. doesn't feel sticky. Okay. We'll repeat the test of the CA and the accelerator. This time, the, the bottom side, unfortunately, was a failure because we actually had some paper on the outside that I didn't realize of the stuff. This is just set up in the one minute since I've been talking, but let's see how it does. Pretty nice. That also seems to have broken the plastic. It was a nice joint but it was definitely not as strong as the one with the mechanical grip as well but still a very nice result our next is our epoxy trial this is the one that we did with the two jars of epoxy um, it's on there it feels a little bit flexible still because epoxy does need the 24 hours i could look at this area that i left here and it's flexible, so I'm not going to put it to the test. I'll let that dry a full 24 hours. We might come back and do a video of that. But it's hard enough that I could actually move it. I could remove my, my jigs, and I'll just let it sit. The nice thing is I put it on one side, so I do use epoxy, epoxy frequently on the insides to reinforce pieces where nobody's going to see them. I'll show you some examples of that later. The next thing we did was we used some solvents in an applicator and we clamped this thing and we poured it around. When you have a huge surface area like this, it might seal through the wicking before it gets to the middle. So you have this unhardened or actually unaffected area. If you want to avoid that, just put a couple of drops in the middle first, squeeze them together and then wick it around. Well, let's see how this is. This could use another hour to dry or so, but... I got a little bit of peel on one edge. I think. No, I can't separate it. I'm just bending the pieces. So that's an amazing joint. Of course, solvents depend on having the right solvent for the right material. This one happens to be perfect for acrylics. It's made for acrylics. It works very well. If you're using ABS, acetone works very well. Um, you'll have to look up the different solvents for your different materials and find the right one and experiment with them. On PVC, the solvent is standard hardware store solvent that you could find in the plumbing and electrical fitting area. This one you could actually see, it wasn't a great mechanical grip Usually for those fittings, you get the ones that are slightly conical and go in with a great pressure. But let's go ahead and test this solvent out. There is no way that I'm ever going to split this. So it's, oh man, it's actually making contact on a very small area. You can see at the bottom. But there, I can't break this. There's no way. The PVC solvents are really amazing. Let me grab the um, contact cement one. Sorry, I just put it in the corner. This one was done using a rubber cement. It would be equally or even better to use a spray glue. You put them on the two halves. We let them dry until they were just tacky to the touch like, um, like masking tape. And then you just push them together. That's what I did here. 
The great thing is this won't break from bending and flexing. I can create a peel situation here where I can get it to lift off. You can see that. So we can actually break a rubber cement by putting it into an extreme peel. But it's got a great strength here. And if this both pieces were flexible, that peel would never happen. You really have to pull one apart from another. So rubber cement is, is a nice alternative in some cases. I don't use it frequently unless I'm using flexible materials, but it's a great thing to have. Now just let's talk about a few of the drawbacks and I'll show you a few examples um, on actual models and then we'll, uh, we'll move forward. Like I told you before, the problem with CA is hazing, especially on PLA. Here I actually glued two pieces of PLA test plates that I'm using. I left intentionally a little bit of CA on the outside and you can see that hazing. Can you see that right there? That white hazing right there is just naturally what CA or super glue tends to do on PLA. It's an issue. You could sand it off. You can use some super glue solvents. But it's one of the reasons why I like to use super glue on the inside and in an invisible area. Keep it away from the outside. Um, with epoxies, here was a piece that had to support a lot of weight for a headband. I actually had to, at the time, print it in multiple parts. Um, and what I did, maybe you could zoom in here. I actually made a butt joint, so it splits halfway and one half overlaps the other. That way I had an incredible surface area and great mechanical join. I used some epoxy and then I even grinded it a little bit to make it smooth. I could have done a much better job. This was just for a quick prototype. I didn't have to have it exactly perfectly aesthetic. But this joint is amazing and allowed me to have the full strength and flexibility I needed. The epoxy is slightly more flexible than CA, and it does create some, a lot of gap fill, so you can use this to fill in holes. I use it to create this piece here as well, and this piece, and I have a very, very strong part. There's no question about it, that's bonded completely. Now, this piece is a prototype I was working for a customer, I'll try to take off some of the other pieces. I needed to have an idea of the external volume of this VR housing. Um, externally, it's pretty decent. We did a much nicer prototype later on. This was mostly to test just scale and component fit. So I wasn't concerned with the inside or the underside. I used a lot of CA and baking powder, and you could actually see the remnants on the underside and on the inside because this piece was made quickly on my 3D printer. There was quite a bit on this size before I built the enclosure. We had a, quite a bit of distortion because the pieces would cool and shrink over time. But I was able with CA and baking soda to tack this thing into place and to make it one solid piece. Um, one solid piece that we were able to put on foam elements. I was able to drive in my other elements and actually do physical tests on people's heads with this. So using the right glue in the right spots can get you the desired effects. You have to know where not to use them, when not to use them, and I would suggest trying on your own materials, on test materials, before doing it on your final piece. That's everything for today. Let me know um, if you liked this video, if you found it helpful. Please share it with others. I'm going to be doing a few follow-ups on how to glue flexible filaments. I've learned quite a bit from that. Um, and I'll eventually also, if I have enough requests, show you how to spot repair and sand and smooth pieces for painting and final quality of uh, prototype presentations. So thank you and subscribe, give me a thumbs up, spread this around.